So, as you might have guessed, the origin of the absorption lines and the emission lines has to do with the atom. Everything's made of atoms. So we're going to talk about the structure of atoms, atomic structure. The basic structure of an atom is you have a nucleus. And in the nucleus you have protons and neutrons. The simplest atom is just one proton, and that's hydrogen. Hydrogen is one proton. The number of protons determines the element, like helium has two protons, and uh, the most common form of helium has two neutrons as well. But you can change the number of neutrons, and those are called different isotopes, but if you change the number of protons, you're changing the element. It's a different element. So the number of protons determines the element. The nucleus is very small, very compact. You have all those uh, charges uh, in close proximity. And in fact, you know, think about it, the neutrons have no charge, the protons are all positively charged. And, some, and like charges want to repel. So the strong nuclear force has to be stronger than the electromagnetic force, because all the protons will want to scatter. But there's a strong nuclear force that holds all those protons together and the neutrons as well. And out in the outskirts, we have electrons, itty bitty little particles with negative charge. So you got positive charge here, negative charge out in the outskirts. And usually if the atom is neutral, you have as many electrons as protons, but it doesn't have to be neutral. But your most simple atom is this one right here, one proton and uh, one electron out in the outskirts. Now, like we did with the solar system, the sun, earth, moon anyway, we built a scale model. I want to do the same thing here because we're going to look at a whole bunch of figures of atoms and I don't want you to walk away with the wrong idea. Kind of like when we looked at a whole bunch of pictures of the sun, earth, and moon, you can't draw it to scale. The distances are so huge compared to the sizes of the objects, and I want you to have a picture in your mind of the correct size of things. So just like we built a scale model of the solar system, let's quickly build a scale model of the atom. So for the solar system we use, this is the sun, it's uh, about a four inch ball, and for the earth we used this little one millimeter. Well, one millimeter, and the moon, you know, we just used a speck of uh, chalk, I'm not going to pull the mallet out again, and the separation between the moon and the earth was about an inch, and between the earth moon system and the sun was 38 feet. Now, it's kind of comparable, but even more empty, an atom is more empty than the solar system. You, you remember that scale model of the solar system? A lot of empty space. If we use this as the proton, the electron it's hard to say how much smaller it is. The proton does have an extent to it. The electron depends on how you measure it. Um, but at least its mass, anyway, is about one two thousandth that of the proton. So the electron would be quite small. It would be so far away that it would have to be outside this room. So let's not use that analogy. Let's compare it to the sun, moon, the Earth-Moon system. So here we have the Earth. The Moon, again, is a little almost invisible speck about an inch away. An atom will let this be the proton. So if someone want to come up here and hold the tape measure again and hold the proton? You don't even have to hold the proton. We, all, we can all pretend you're holding the proton. That way I don't lose my only proton. Which doubles as the Earth. Come on up. Okay. So you can stand here. And let's see. The Sun, Earth... There we go. The Sun, Earth system was 38 feet. And so this is, let's uh, flip it around, because we're going to be in English. This is going to be about 33 feet. Right about here. So if you're holding that little one millimeter uh, ball bearing as the proton, the electron would be this almost invisible speck this far away. Atoms, as you can see, are almost completely empty space, even more so than the Sun-Earth system or the Earth-Moon system. It's the Earth-Moon system, the Earth was that size, the Moon was comparatively small, but they're one inch apart. Here, we have 33 inches, or 33 feet apart. Make sense? Everything in the universe seems to be pretty much empty space. Bohr model. So this is kind of a simple explanation, a simple 
model for the atom. The atom is actually more complicated than this, and we'll talk about that. But the Bohr model is uh, dealing primarily uh, with the simplest element. I'm just going to consider hydrogen right now. And he says, okay, in the case of hydrogen, we have a proton, we have an electron going around it, and the force, the electromagnetic force, is a one over distance squared force, just like the gravitational force is one over distance squared. So initially, you view this as a mini solar system, where the protons like the sun, the electrons like the earth, and it's going around. But uh, that leads to a number of complications. We'll see that. I want to mention the gravitational analogy first. Now I'm going to introduce Bohr's model, and you're going to see it's actually kind of crazy if you're thinking about it in those terms. So first of all, he said the orbits were quantized. I'm going to put orbits in quotes, because we're going to see that in reality the electron is not orbiting around. It's much more complicated due to wave nature of these things. But uh, in this simple idea where you think of it as a gravitational system, what Bohr said is it doesn't orbit at any old distance. There's a ground state where it orbits at the distance of the scale model that we uh, built. Then there's an excited state where it can orbit twice as far out, and it can orbit three times as far out and four times as far out, but it can't orbit in between. And that's kind of a crazy idea, because if you think about the solar system, I can put something between Earth and Mars, an asteroid, a satellite, a rocket ship, and it will orbit the sun just fine. But here, same one over distance squared type of force, but he's saying you can only orbit at quantized distances. So that's kind of crazy. But you'll see, by doing that, we can actually explain the lines that we saw. The other thing that he throws in here, he says the orbits are stable. At first, that sounds like what you'd expect. Uh, you know, the Earth going around the Sun, we've been going around the Sun for 4.6 billion years. It seems pretty stable. But the solar system exists in isolation. You know, there's no other star right next to us. Now imagine if a star came through the solar system and just kind of passed through the solar system and went on its way. What would happen to all the little planets around our Sun and around the other star in this close encounter? Yeah, they'd be thrown out, scattered all over the place. The planets are like specks of dust uh, compared to uh, the mass of the stars. The stars would pass each other, and all the planets would be scattered. Fortunately, there's a lot of space between the stars. We exist in isolation. But that's not true with the atoms. You're made of atoms, and the atoms that you're made of are right next to the other atom. In fact, they're often bonded together. So it's like solar system on top of solar system on top of solar system. They're constantly running into each other. And so if you go with the gravitational analogy, the electron should not be stable there. It's constantly being disturbed. The electron should be scattered out, just like the planets are scattered out. Uh, or scattered in. Remember, the electron's negatively charged, the proton's positively charged. They would like to kind of merge with each other if the velocities are right. You scatter it, and a lot of them would uh, you know, be thrown into the nucleus. You'd implode. You should implode. Um, by classical descriptions of physics, it's an unstable situation with all these atoms or mini solar systems in touching proximity to each other. So, but he said they're stable and they're quantized, and these are both kind of crazy ideas. Now, the reason he was able to pull this off is Young's double slit experiment. Now, we considered this for light. He said if you take light and throw it up against the screen with the two slits, it goes through both slits. One particle of light emitted travels as a wave, it goes through both slits, it interferes with itself, and the proof of that is the interference pattern on the screen. Even though once it hits the screen, it's a particle again, the pattern that's fleshed out is that of uh, a wave that has, that has gone through both slits. Well, you can do this experiment with electrons too, not just light, but with electrons. And actually, I lied. The, the sequence that I showed you before, uh, that data was actually electrons, so they've done it with both light and electrons. And so if you send electrons through this one at a time, you release it maybe from an atom, you detect it on the screen, it has a well-defined position when you detected it, it fleshes out the interference pattern you have there. So the electron traveled as a wave. The electron went not through one slit or the other, went through both slits, interfered with itself, and then hit the screen. So electrons travel as waves. So that's the key insight here. We'll get to this in a second, but let's draw. Let's just try to draw this here. Here we have uh, the Bohr atom with the proton here, the electron going around it, but suppose it's going around as a wave. So I'll draw kind of a wave, and 
I was kind of screwed this up, but waving out and waving in and out and in and out. Okay, so what I've drawn here, it would keep coming around on top of itself. This is a wave that would interfere constructively with itself. Every time it's going around, if you still want to think of it orbiting, but really the wave just exists. It's a wave of probability. And it's a wave that's in phase with itself. And so you have constructive interference. The wave gets stronger. But you could also imagine uh, the opposite case. Maybe you have a circle of a slightly different size and the same electron wavelength going around like this and... Yeah, and then this, and it comes back, and now it's opposite the next time. Whereas down before, it's up, and so forth, and so on. And so, this kind of situation would interfere destructively. This is destructive interference, and this is constructive. So, if it's at a particular distance such that, given its wavelength, it interferes destructively with itself, there's no probability that the electron is orbiting at that distance. So there are going to be particular distances where you have constructive interference. And so you will have quantized orbits. Let's write it up formally here. So the condition, the condition is simple. If uh, the circumference of the orbit is uh, equal to an integer multiple of the wavelength, then you have constructive interference. If it's like one wavelength or two wavelengths, by the time it comes around, it interferes with itself. But if it's one and a half or two and a half, it won't interfere with itself. It will, de well, it will destructively interfere with itself. So basically the whole loop is the circumference of that circle, two pi r, where r is your distance from the proton. If it's equal to some integer, where n is one, two, three, etc times the electron wavelength, I'll just write it in words, electron wavelength, then you get constructive interference. If n is 1.5, 2.5, you get destructive interference. Now we don't even have to write down what the electron wavelength is. The idea is r is proportional to n. So n of 1 corresponds to what we call the ground state. So that's where the electron uh, exists, unless it's in one of the excited states. And if two corresponds to twice the radius, so here we have the what we call the first excited state. N of three is the second excited state. And it's unfortunate that the ends and the number of the excited state don't match. I'll try to use this terminology here mostly, ground state, first excited state, second excited state. But the point is the orbits are quantized. just as Bohr said. And they're stable because the constructive interference, it reinforces itself. The atoms can jostle into each other, the electrons aren't scattered, because if they were to leave, they'd have to transition through a region of no probability, where the electron can't be. So it's uh, easier for them to stay put. You can, of course, move them from level to level. So that's our simple board model. Questions about that? Okay, now let me just take a minute and talk about what's really going on. It's, it's as I've described, but we have this picture in our head that these are little mini solar systems with the electrons orbiting. But I just gave a wave description as to what's going on. So this is actually a more appropriate picture to put up there. The electron is not traveling, it doesn't have a well-defined position at any given time. We don't know where it is until we actually try to detect it. You know, on campus we have courses in quantum mechanics at the undergrad level, grad level, and you go into it in a lot more detail, and you can actually compute uh, where it's probable for the electron to be and not to be. It's not just at the ground state, the first excited state. There's a range around those radii where it's not possible. It's easiest if you look at the first excited state to start. Here we got the ground state and the first excited state. The blue dots correspond to where the electron could be, the most probable locations. And so clearly the most probable location is around that first excited state, around that circle. You could be a little bit closer, you could be a little bit farther away. There's even some probability you could be um, very distant from this position, but most likely you're at this radius if you have the appropriate energy. The uh, ground state is over here. 
you have less energy, and we'll talk about the energy transitions, but it's another place where there's probability that the electron can be. And again, if you're not trying to detect its exact location, it could be anywhere in there. In fact, it's everywhere in there, because it's traveling as a wave. Wave doesn't have a well-defined position, so it's everywhere. Only the act of observing gives it a well-defined position. Which again is a crazy idea, but that's how the universe works at small scales. We're back to the Bohr description. Now, instead of drawing those fuzzy waves of probability, back to the simple idea where we kind of think of it as orbiting at particular quantized levels. Here in um, the first configuration, we have the ground state. The electron is um, most likely at that distance. Now, if a particular amount of energy comes in, say a photon comes in and has just the right energy, it can boost it up to the first excited state. It takes more energy to orbit at a higher state than a lower state. And that does have a gravitational analogy. If I want to orbit the Earth in low Earth orbit versus um, orbiting at the distance of the moon, it takes more energy to get to the moon than to get up to the space station. So it's just because you're trying to get away from the mass of the Earth. There's a gravitational pull between the rocket and the Earth takes a certain amount of energy to get this high up, takes more energy to get this high up, takes more energy to get to the next level up. The atom, you have quantized levels, you only have very specific possibilities, but it still takes certain amounts of energy to get up to those different heights above the central charge. Here's the ground state, but if you come in with just the right amount of energy, you can move up to the first excited state. Come up with, uh, well, we'll see in the next one, you can come up with more energy and move up to even higher excited states. If the photon comes in with not the right energy, it would be the right energy to kind of boost it halfway between levels. It won't absorb it, because the electron has nowhere that it's allowed to go, quantum mechanically, and the light will pass right through. So what we have here is a mechanism for absorbing very specific energies. So we know that the orbits are quantized. That means the energies are quantized, and we know energy is uh, proportional to frequency. With light, it's um, Planck's constant, E is equal to H times frequency. So if the energies are quantized, the frequencies are quantized. And we have our other expression, wavelength times frequency is the speed of the wave, which for light is a constant, so wavelength is equal to c divided by nu. So if the frequencies are quantized, the wavelengths are quantized. So all these things are quantized, which gives us the very specific wavelengths being absorbed in absorption line spectra. Now, as you can see from the last panel over here, it moves up to the higher energy state, but give it enough time and it will re-release that energy and jump back down to the ground state. You can never predict when it's going to happen. It's kind of a probabilistic process, like many things are, down at that scale. But you have an atom sitting there in the first excited state. Give it a certain amount of time. It could be a long amount of time. It could be a short amount. It will re-release the exact same energy it absorbed and go down to the ground state. Hence, uh, this will lead to our emission line spectra. Here's a more complicated example. Here we have enough energy coming in to boost you to the second excited state, which is the third level. N of 3 is the second excited state. N of 1 is the ground state. N of 2 is the first excited state. So confusing. The numbers don't match up, the numbers and the names. But here we have enough second excited state. We have two ways that the electron can decay back down to the ground state. Come right back down to the ground state, releasing the same ultraviolet photon that it took to get it there, or it can hop down in steps. It can go down first to the first excited state and release a lower energy photon, visible, and then from the first excited state down to the ground state. The energies of those two photons equal to the energy of the incoming photon. So you can have either of these decay mechanisms against probabilistic. Some of the time you get that, some of the time you get this. 